afternoon and welcome to our Glendale City Council workshop. This meeting is for council members to review and discuss important issues, projects, and future council meeting agenda items. It's a work study session only and allows the council to hear input from city staff. No action will be taken at this workshop and there will not be an opportunity for public comment. This meeting is streaming live on Glendale's Facebook and YouTube pages and the city's cable television station, Glendale Channel 11. Thank you for joining us. And good afternoon. Welcome to Glendale City Council workshop session, March 26, 2024. The meeting is called to order. Uh, roll call is not necessary. All the members are here. If you could take note of that, Mr. Bauer. With that said, you'd go ahead and uh, uh, well, actually, enter item number one. We are not going to hear, is my understanding. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, uh, staff had made a request that we hold that uh, for the future. <clears throat> so with that, would you go ahead and introduce item number two? Balanced scorecard update. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council. We have five items on today's workshop agenda. The first one will be led by Jenny Durda, our Director of Organizational Performance. Thank you, Mr. Phelps. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. As Mr. Phelps said, I'm here today to provide you an update on the strategic planning program from this city called Balanced Scorecard. I'm gonna review the program at both the tier one and the tier two level. Tier one is the citywide level and tier two is the department level. Additionally, I'm going to provide you an update on the training program for Balanced Scorecard. All strategic plans to be effective must run on a continuous improvement cycle of identify, plan, execute, and review. And our balanced scorecard works on that same cycle. I'm gonna use this cycle to review with you where we are at for tier one and tier two. For tier one, we have been at the review stage for several years now. We are completing the full cycle and you have received updates uh, over the last several years on tier one initiatives, <coughs> excuse me, such as Glendale One, the resident survey, and the city performance portal. And KPIs for the city have been collected and reported out sometime now publicly uh, on that city performance portal. We've identified areas of success, many of which contributed to our What Works Cities Gold Level certification. The next step will be to start the cycle again for tier one in identify. Specifically, we'll be reviewing the intended results key performance indicators and selecting some new citywide initiatives. For the tier two, um, over the last year, 20 departments have fully completed the plan step of the cycle. They have all have completed strategic plans that have been reviewed by the city management. We've been working with budget and finance and how to incorporate these developed plans into the budget process. In the city budget books you'll be provided, uh, coming up soon, you'll see department purpose statements, their strategic maps, similar to what you've seen before on the tier one level. Additionally, all 20 of those departments have moved to the execute phase of the process. Each department is working on collecting KPIs they identified in their plans and beginning their initiatives. You will see some of these updated KPIs reflected in the budget books um, and the budget presentations next week, um, as well as some of the historical KPIs that you're used to seeing. Some of these newly identified KPIs didn't have a way to collect any kind of historical data on them. So when those are used, they'll just have the projected, uh, the projected number for this year and the goal for, the final, for next year. And in organizational performance, we're providing support to these departments as they're working on these plans. So the next few slides, you'll see what some of that support looks like. Some of the accomplishments of the program over the last year are we started holding quarterly performance review meetings with departments um, that had completed scorecards. We're helping them track their results and providing whatever support they need as they implement this program. As part of the work, we provided a tool for them to help them track the KPIs in a centralized place. Our performance program manager, Jeff Bratcher, who's here with me today, um, has done an excellent job creating this tool and the dashboards that are being utilized for <coughs> the program. You can see on this slide an image of our department's data collection piece in that tool. And so that's an example of what that looks like. Here we've got an image of what the tool looks like a couple of months ago on the summary dashboard. 
as a whole. So it, it overviews the program, it shows the overall status, it shows KPIs, and it shows the initiatives and their phases as, that they're at at this time. So for our department in organizational performance, our scorecard has a couple of initiatives that deal with the balanced scorecard program. So a couple of those initiatives are continuing our quarterly performance review meetings. We wanna ensure that we have frequent touch points with departments to provide them whatever support they might need as they execute their tier two scorecard. As I mentioned earlier, we've been working with budget and finance to continue the integration of performance information into the budget books. And we'll be working on updating the performance portal over this next year with additional public facing KPIs and appropriate, as appropriate <coughs> and that the data is vetted. So the last initiative I wanna to mention to you is the training for balanced scorecard, the contract for which you'll be seeing on the consent agenda tonight. We are just seeing the training that we're providing to staff. We're shifting it towards um, strategic plan implementation rather than development as it was before. The training courses will prepare staff to drive forward that strategic planning within their departments and give them a greater understanding of how to utilize KPIs appropriately. We'll be providing training to staff who are working on their department balanced scorecards at the tier two level and those who support tier one work who haven't received training in the past. That completes my updates on balanced scorecard and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have. Any questions? Good job. Ms. Barr, item three. Council item of special interest, renaming and dedication of the Glendale Community Center. Mayor, members of the council to provide staff report is John Kennedy, Director of Parks and Recreation. Thank you, Mr. Phelps, Mayor and Council, uh, here today to uh, give you an update on the uh, Councilmember Aldama CIOSI uh, on the renaming and rededication of the Glendale Community Center. So the Glendale Community Center <coughs> is located at 5401 West Ocotillo Road in the Ocotillo District. It uh, was recently uh, received internal and external uh, renovations and reopened last year to community programming. So the CIOSI is interested in renaming the center after former council member uh, Norma S. Alvarez, as well as dedicating the community center to three prior council members, Manny Martinez, Tranquilina uh, Garcia, and Joe Silva. So our staff estimates, uh, estimated staff times, about 80 hours of staff time, uh, approximately $5,000 to purchase and install a, a, a plaque for the dedication as well as I do have an updated figure of approximately $16,000 to uh, purchase and install uh, building signage should we move forward. So if uh, should council agree to proceed with the CIOSI, uh, the following process of the park and facility naming policy uh, would be followed, which was a suggestion from the council member. That would be to perform community outreach, present the, parks and rec present the findings to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission for their <coughs> recommendation, and we turn to a future city council workshop. So with that, we are seeking a direction on this CIOSI and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mayor. I thought at a previous discussion of this item that there was consensus by council to go through the normal process, the regular process, and that's what I expected to see was the results of that process today. I think it is admirable to suggest that um, the center be named after former elected officials. I have no problem with that. But I would certainly like community consensus. So I, I still expect us to go through our normal process. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council Member, Council Member Clark. Um, it, we do have uh, two similar requests in different stages of, of uh, process at this point. The L, there is a request for to rename El Barrio Park, which is right across the street, that we are currently seeking feedback. Uh, this item, I believe, was just uh, raised as a CIOSI in February, so this is the first time we're actually bringing it to this, uh, this discussion, to my <coughs> understanding. Thank you. I, I guess I missed that, but 
But nevertheless, I would expect it to go through the process. Thank you. Councilmember Turner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I can support moving this forward through the normal, <coughs> excuse me, through the normal process. And to me, part of the normal process is that consideration for this recognition should be based on their contribution to the community outside of having been a city council member. We have plenty of individuals that have served on the city council over the years and done so notably and you know that we haven't named things for but uh we have we also have other things in the community that we have named and those things have been <coughs> named not because they were council members or elected officials but because of the contribution they made to the community outside of that and that's how <coughs> i would like these this uh to be considered is in that vein and i'm sure that personally i i'm confident that each of these um stand well in their community contributions outside of having been a council member and I would like for that to be the focus of their recognition. Thank you. Mark. Thank you, Mayor. I'm not sure I under, so are, is the I idea to name it after one former council member and then dedicate it to three other people? I just want to make sure I understand what the what the concept even is. Mayor. Thank, thank you, Mayor. <laughs> thank you, Council Member. Um, I'll, I'll go back to uh, Council Member Clark's um, comments. Absolutely, and if you all, and I believe you all did receive the scope of work, I asked specifically when I met with staff, and it's written here, that we go through every process that uh, is necessary for this to go through. Uh, it'll be, there'll be a performing a community outreach presented to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission and then return to us for a uh, council workshop to study it after it's uh, been given a recommendation. So that is the <coughs> formal process um, and it does meet the Parks and Recreation naming um, uh, regulations, if you will, that the person has to be <coughs> deceased. Uh, and then so so it covers that and then Councilmember Turner uh, had a great comment um, Councilmember Alvarez was very instrumental as were the others in bringing the community center to Glendale prior to being a council member she her her efforts in that building she went out and raised um, private dollars to help the city the city says to her and to the others bring us five thousand dollars and we'll help build it she went out and did that I believe she even exceeded that and uh, so, and then to the question that uh, Councilmember Tomachoff has, yes, the, the three council members all resided in the Ocotillo district immediately in the area of the building. And um, I felt it necessary that the building be dedicated to those as well, not only because of their service as a council member, but because of their contributions to that community and to the center when it was trying to be developed. So um, th that is the request and again, go through all the processes because that's what this council was asked prior and this is what I would expect and what I asked of staff. So thank you so much. Mayor. Go ahead. Th then I was confused because staff has estimated cost in here of moving forward with the building being named the Norma S. Alvarez building and then the plaque. So looking at the 80 hours and the plaque cost an estimated building signage cost, which we learned today could be as high as 60,000. I mean, I thought that meant that was the direction in which we were proceeding. Uh, and then we see for council consideration include, should council agree to proceed with the CIOSI, the following process of the park and, and facility naming policy would be so it was confusing to me, and I, I do expect this to go through the process. Uh, if, if during the process there is a staff recommendation for Alvarez and the other council members, that's fine. <coughs> but the community has the right to weigh in. Thank you. Okay, Lauren. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. I mean, I understand the, the thought process behind behind this, but my thought, what comes to mind is wouldn't it be better to spend the $65,000 on investing in something in the community center? I mean, that's not for, just for me to say, but I mean, $65,000 to put a name on it, how does that 
how does that really help the community center when you could actually take the money and invest it in, I don't know, iPads or something that would actually be a beneficial to the people who use the community center? So I just wanted to say that's kind of my thought is that in addition to the 5,000, <clears> putting a new sign, actual sign on the building is not included here, but that would be part of it. And I know this is coming back to us. I mean, I don't mean any disrespect to any um, one of these people preceded me in my district. Uh, Councilmember Martinez was a you know was a fine man, but the thought also is you know we need to go out for park bonds here pretty soon. I don't know would this come out of the parks? I mean, I didn't know it'd be come out of general fund, but sixty five thousand dollars is a lot of money, and it could be I feel like better spent. Thank you, Mayor, Board Council members. I apologize. That must not have enunciated very clearly. The estimated cost for the signage that wasn't I didn't have in time for the PowerPoint is sixteen thousand, not sixty. My apologies. Any other go ahead. Um, to Council Member Tomachoff's question about could this money be spent differently that would be more beneficial? Um, I mean that's a that's really a value judgment, and I would say that it is good for our community to recognize the people that have made Glendale be Glendale <coughs> and to provide positive role models and to give particularly our young people in the community something and someone to look up to, but also for you know the older segment of our community recognition of the people that uh, maybe they volunteered alongside of to help make good things happen in their neighborhoods. I think all of that's positive and, and worth investing in. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, thank you. Um, I, I agree with the uh, recommendation, which is to uh, uh, do the outreach uh, and uh, and then the, go to the commission and then bring it back to this uh, the body to have further discussion once they have <coughs> put in the recommendation. Mr. Hughes. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I knew the families, like a lot of people did, grow up in Glendale, and I think it's uh, an excellent idea, and i like to see it move forward. Thank you. And, and I, uh, I don't think a lot of people know uh, the history with Norma in my family. Uh, Norma actually worked with my mother, Maryville Hospital, uh, a long time ago, a long, long time ago. And the thing I loved about Norma is I don't believe that anybody truly truly cared more for her citizens. Uh, I don't think there's another council member alive that, that has tried harder than Norma did. Uh, you didn't always agree with what she said, but uh, everybody knew where she was at as far as serving. Uh, I, I have no problem uh, with this thing moving forward. Uh, if it was $60,000, I was gonna have a fit, but 16, I think that uh, if we shop that, maybe we can even get that a little bit less and still get the recognition that uh, they're looking for. So I'd certainly support it, but it sounds like you have consensus. Thank you. Uh, next item, please. Council item of special interest, Valley Metro's Ride Choice Program. Apologies. Mayor, members of the council, here to provide staff report will be Kevin Link, Transit Administrator, uh, but I think that uh, our Director of Transportation, Shady Boss, mm -hmm. has some comments. Thank you, Mr. Phelps. Good afternoon, Mayor and the Council. My name is Shahid Abbas, Director of Transportation. With me is Cameron Link, our Transit Administrator. On September 14, 2023, Council Member Tamachoff requested a Council item of special interest related to a Valley Metro Ride Choice pilot program. To provide regional paratransit para riders more flexibility choosing transportation services. Subsequently, on December 12, 2023, the council gave consensus to the following scope of work. Per trip cost comparison of current paratransit and right choice option, Glendale participation in the right choice, the right choice program as part of one year pilot project, <coughs> allowing both seniors and persons with disability to use the program. Only trips taken outside of Glendale will be eligible for this pilot program and lastly, estimated funding required and possible funding sources for this pilot program. Now, before 
I hand over the presentation to Mr. Link. I would like to inform council that, that Mr. Link is retiring on May 31st after 22 years of meritorious service with the city. And this very well be his last appearance before this council. With this, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Boss. Okay, so good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm happy I, to I'll need you to move your microphones closer to your mouth. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Maybe turn it on. Happy to be here today to go. provide, present some information on the Ride Choice Program. Um, first, I just want to touch on the existing services that currently exist for our residents and those in the region. Um, we provide ADA service within the city limits, obviously, um, and on-demand same-day service within Glendale. And as far as the regional service, we have the ADA paratransit service, which Valley Metro operates for Glendale, and then the Ride Choice Program. So the, just a brief um, recap of the uh, regional ADA paratransit service. It's operated by Valley Metro, as I mentioned. The customer pays $4 a trip, regardless of the length or whether or not they're in a wheelchair. Um, it's a shared ride service on a paratransit bus. It does require an advance reservation of at least one day in advance. And for 25, we are estimating our cost to Glendale is going to be about $1.7 million for this service with an estimated 24,000 trips provided. <coughs> okay, so the Ride Choice Program. So the Ride Choice Program is operated by Valley Metro um, to provide another alternative means of transportation to folks um, within the region. Uh, it is for either certified ADA, current certified ADA uh, eligibility people or seniors age 65 and above in participating communities. Request rides when they need it. They don't have to book the same trip. It's a 24 seven service. They can call at two in the morning if they want to get a ride. Customers have the option of choosing between a trip program of 20 or 50 trips per month or a miles program. On the, tw on the trip program, they play, pay $3 per trip up to eight miles. And each additional mile costs $2. And then if they're on the mileage program, it's capped at 50 miles a trip, but they pay only, they only pay $3 for the trip regardless of how far they ride. But once they reach their 400 miles in the month, they are done and they cannot use the service for the rest of that month. Don't have to share the ride. It's a single seat trip, origin to destination. The city can determine the uh, eligibility rules for the residents. Um, currently, there are four cities that allow both ADA residents and seniors, and then there are seven jurisdictions that require their uh, residents to be ADA certified to use the program. Um, there's the cost, fiscal year 24 cost is between $36 to $57 a trip. That's average, depending on trip length. There's a lot of that goes into that cost, trip length, <coughs> space type, wheelchair, walker, but that's the average cost. I need, I need to ask you a question. Yes, it, sir. it says seniors not eligible, uh, the seven jurisdictions. Yes. You, you don't mean seniors aren't eligible. It's just that senior, because you're old, doesn't qualify. You could be ADA and a senior and still qualify. Mayor, that's correct. For okay. those seven jurisdictions, they have to be certified through the ADA process to use ride choice. Okay. And I that just want to make sure you didn't hate old people. So. No, no. Okay. No. <laughs> it's, okay. It's, it's an eligibility determination made by the city and jurisdiction. And then currently there are 12 providers that, are, that um, provide the service with about, with eight of those that have wheelchair accessible vehicles in their fleet. Okay, here's a quick breakdown of the customer cost comparison between the regional ADA service and ride choice. The average trip length on our regional service in 23 was 13 miles. So our average trip on the regional service was, was 13 miles. So that's the number we used to compare costs, just to compare apples to apples. The resident pays $4, as I mentioned, for that regional paratransit trip, whereas if they were to take a ride choice trip of that same length, it would cost them $13. And then you see the city cost per trip. Again, there's a lot that goes into that um, length, trip length, space type. So. It can range anywhere from 2646 for an eight mile trip cost to the city up to $83 for a 13 mile trip. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, 2646 is for a 13 mile assumed trip 
and then the 8301 is uh, the cost for a 13 mile for a wheelchair. And again, that's based on our historical data. So here's the cost breakdown for an ambulatory trip um, for trip lengths of eight up to 13. The reason I asked for these numbers were because trips less than eight miles, eight miles or less cost the resident $3, that's it. And then 13, we capped it at 13 because that's our average trip length on the regional. So using our historical data, these are the numbers that we used, uh, the range that we used to come up with a trip cost. There's also, um, in the 25 Valley Metro proposed budget, the overhead is uh, $2.27 $2 per trip. That cost is in included in the city cost. So that includes the overhead cost per trip. Here's the same thing broken down for wheelchairs. Again, um, it's, you can see the cost to the customer increases as the trip length increases, as does the cost to the city. And again, the overhead is included in these numbers. <coughs> this slide shows the initial 24 estimate for the cities that currently participate in the program within the region. It depicts the number of trips estimated, the gross trip cost, the total amount of federal funding and fair revenue and um, Prop 400 funding, if applicable, that cities used um, to fund this program. There was a mid-year budget adjustment this year of $1 million added to the ride choice budget due to the increase in the expected ridership. Um, total trips so far in ride choice this year through January are up 44% from the same time, same period last year. And the average number of weekday trips has gone up 25% from January to last July, beginning of the fiscal year. So ridership is in definitely increasing in this program. The Valley Metro proposed ride choice budget for 25 is 24% higher than fiscal 23, and they're expected to see a ridership <coughs> increase of approximately 22% over fiscal 24 for 25. Okay, so this is Glendale specific. So as I mentioned before, we're projecting about a $1.7 million cost for our, our regional service in 25 with about 22,000 trips. Based on historical data, we know that about 7,300 of those trips are going to be eight miles or less. And the remaining 15,000 will be over eight miles. So to come up with a cost comparison to see what it would cost the city um, we know that the, eight, uh, the trips over eight miles are probably going to stay on the regional service because that's cheaper for the resident, and that'll cost us about $1.1 million for those 15,000 trips. This is assuming that those 7,300 trips are going to shift to the ride choice program because it's cheaper for the resident, and that'll cost us about $238,000, okay? So if you add that up, that's 1.3 million for the 15,000 longer trips and then the 7,300 shorter trips, 1.3 million. You bring the seniors into it, um, the 9,000 figure is how many trips we provided in fiscal 23 as a senior in, for seniors in, our, in Glendale. So that's the historical data I had, so that's what I went with. And those 9,000 trips would cost us about $421,000. It could be higher, it could be lower. Uh, we, we don't know what the latent demand would be, but for, to have some number to compare it to, that's what I used. So it comes out to be about 1.7 million combined. These are some numbers estimating on the ride choice program. If we did 10,000 trips a year, broken down by our wheelchair percentage, Currently, Glendale has one of the highest wheelchair percentages of, of trips on the regional system in the region. We'd, about 26% of, of our trips are with wheel or for wheelchair clients or walkers. So these are, the, these are the estimated cost of what it would cost the city if we were to do 10,000 trips, et cetera, 12,000, based on those numbers. 
and you can see that it can range anywhere from you know 465 for 10,000 trips <coughs> to about 745,000 if we were to go to 16,000 trips. Okay, that's my portion of the informative program or of the presentation. So now I'm going to turn over back to Mr. Abbas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ling. The summary is the cost of one year right choice pilot program for seniors and ADA eligible residents is estimated between $465,000 to $745,000. That depends upon the number of trips, you know, 10 to 16. Pro program cast within the region increased by 24% from financial year 24 to FY25, with ridership projected to increase by over 22% from 24 to 25. So this, our pilot program is likely to grow if we continue with this one, and we should estimate another 22,000 increase uh, ridership in the following. Both transportation sales tax and the public transportation funding are fully constrained with the transportation within the transportation program. So with that summary, staff is recommended that the department current fiscal constraint does not support to launch this, this program. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so we just had our uh, look at the Valley Metro uh, budget last week. And interestingly enough, and I verified this after by talking to Valley Metro staff, that the trips, they're, they're showing, as you said, the estimating the ride choice trips to increase by about 20%, but the cost per trip decreases as the trips increase. And, they, and that cost savings, savings, I didn't hear that word used, is passed on to cities. They're showing the cost per trip cost decreasing by 11%, even though the, 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 the trips are increasing by 20%. So, and I did speak to Mr. Phelps about this on, uh, because I don't, didn't want to, you know, I'm not, no disrespect intended, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that this, I don't know how these, these calculations were done, but the cost per trip is 11% lower based on 20% increase in ridership. So, I don't, I'm not sure I understand how these were calculated, but there's some discrepancy <coughs> somewhere. Mayor, Councilmember Tomachoff, um, thank you. Um, yes, and I, I, to get my numbers, I took the base numbers that I was given from, from Valley Metro. And, and because of our trip length being longer than most, and I only have the historical data to use from our regional service, I don't have the, you know, the luxury of having a ride choice of, of using it anyway, of having that data. So our, our trip links are longer, which are gonna cost more. We have more wheelchairs than most cities on, on the regional service I'm talking about. Um, so that increases our cost. So, and what you're seeing from Valley Metro is the average cost across the region, where I tailored this one more specific to Glendale based on our historical data using the numbers, the data that I have from the regional service, but I'd be happy to sit down with you at some point and we can go over these numbers. And, and I agree, they're, they're, they don't necessarily match what, what their budget is showing, but then again, that's a big picture. That's the average <coughs> across the region and not per city, because um, it, it's gonna depend on a, on a myriad of different things, fuel cost, trip length, space type. So all that gets rolled up into our, per, our average trip cost. So that is true, if all of our trips were under eight miles, we would have a very low trip cost, no question. But if, uh, and if they're all ambulatory. But once we start adding the wheelchairs and the, and the uh, walkers into it, then our costs go up exponentially as well, and then the trip length. Now, if the, like I said, if the trip length comes down and we don't see the 13 mile average trip length, I agree, our costs would be lower. But for comparison, I only had, you know, I went with what our average trip distance was on the regional. But I'd be happy to sit down and we can go over the numbers. Uh, well, I, that sitting down with me is gonna, not going to help because we're looking for council consensus. So how is sitting down with me going to help get council consensus? And seven, the seven cities that are using this for only ADA paratransit, and just so the paratransit cost is incredibly expensive. We're spending a lot of money on 
just standard paratransit that we're using buses and we're driving a lot of times one person around on a bus which is a more expensive way to get somebody around than using ride share uh, ride choice um, but all of these other cities are saving money taking their paratransit riders on using ride choice they're all they're all saving money and Valley Metro says that the cost per trip, the 11% cost per trip that they're realizing in the trip increasing based on what they're, what they're seeing in real, the real world in these cities that are already doing it is being passed on to the cities. So I'm, I just, you know, I, I would like to maybe take a look at just offering it for paratransit. Obviously, you're saying wheelchairs. If somebody's using a wheelchair, they're not ambulatory, they're... Uh, are you there then they're ADA certified is that on the regional system yes ma'am obviously yes so, but they don't have to be um, depending on what the council what, would, want to would do. we only be offering then if could we only offer this to, to people who are ADA certified in the regional system it's up to the city and but we, yeah, sh if, we should if, only if be offering paratransit of sorry chair, mayor I think we should only be I mean we should require because of the cost of the of the of the ride we should be because we're absorbing a lot of this cost, they should be certified. And I didn't know we weren't getting uh, our paratransit riders certified. Are we doing that? Our, our ADA customers? Yes. Yes, ma'am. They have to go through the process, down, Valley Metro certification process. Okay. Eligibility yeah, because process. Of, uh, because oh, we shouldn't yes. be offering this. Or they couldn't use the service if okay. they haven't gone through that I thought, process. I, I misunderstood you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, Mayor, I guess what I'd like to say is would the, would the council be willing to have them take another run at this only for only paratransit riders and take a look at this and maybe you know work with Valley Metro, work with Ken and some other people at Valley Metro to take another look at what would the cost actually be if we just tr did a, a pilot, even if it was only for six months then, to take a look at real numbers and see if we're able to, these, para these paratransit rides are soon gonna be $100 a trip. That's a reality. So I, I feel like this is something we should try to get a handle on um, like these other cities are doing, and they are saving money doing it. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Phelps. Yeah, Mayor, members of the council, Councilmember Tomachop. I think you know, this is a council item of special interest. We don't have to make a decision today, but I think what we could do in very short order is look at the assumptions and make sure we're comparing kind of the apples to apples, and we can get this agendized for another workshop really quickly. And then we can look at some of the policy implications as well and see if maybe there's some recommendations more on the policy of how we manage the program might put us better in line that would then build a better business case for going that route. So if that if you're comfortable with that, uh, we can go to work on that uh, you know immediately and try to get this re-agendized, re uh, perhaps even for our next workshop in two weeks. Yeah, that would be that would that would work for me. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd be in support of following that, that process, mainly uh, with the ADA. Uh, we currently offer those services, and if there's a way to do it at a less cost for the city, I, I would be in favor. I, I do have some hesitancy adding additional service right now that was going to cost quite a bit more than what we're paying, even if we have a transition from one to the other. That would be a concern I have uh, to make sure that whatever we do, that we're actually going to save some uh, some money for the taxpayers, uh, whichever process we go with. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Link, is there any requirement that these trips be medically related or shopping necessity or anything along those lines, or is it just Mayor, Councilmember Turner, no. It can no. be used for anything. If they want to go to McDonald's at 2 in the morning, it, no, there's no restrictions on trip purpose. Thank you. And then on the... So there's kind of like three different plans here, the 20 trip plan, the 50 trip plan, or the five, 400 miles a month plan. So on that one, the 400 miles a month, um, that's capped at 50 miles per trip. Is that round trip or one way? That's one way, sir. One way? Yes, sir. Wow. Um, so, because I was assuming it was gonna be 25 and 25 miles or I was, I was assuming it'd be round trip, which would be 25 one way, but it's one way. 25 will get you to Mesa, Gilbert, Chandler, Anthem, uh, but 50 will get you to Wickenburg and New River and quite a few other places. So if an individual, say they're going to 
a function of whatever kind, and they're going to stay there two or three hours. Does the transit wait for them, or do we then send somebody else out to New River or Mesa or something to bring them back? Mayor, Councilman Turner, um, the way I understand it is they, they, it's a pretty much an on-demand service. I, I'm not sure if they can book return trips, but no, it wouldn't be where the, the taxi or the provider would stand by and wait for them. Um, they would either book, book a trip when they're ready to go or, um, or book the return trip in advance. I'm not quite, I'm not exactly sure if that's allowed on, in the Ride Choice program, but I can certainly look into it. Okay. But it's, it's pretty much like a taxi service, so they would drop them off and then go and then come back. And then the return trip would be provided by whoever was available in the area that they're in. Coming back to Glendale, or would somebody have to be dispatched from Glendale to go up to 50 miles to bring them back? Uh, Mayor, Councilmember Turner, there's 12 providers in the program, like I mentioned. The clients can choose who they want to use. So Lyft is one of the providers, along with 11 others, and they can specifically ask for that provider. Okay. So and it's, 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 they're under contract. Those 12 providers are under contract with Valley Metro for this program. So it wouldn't be, they wouldn't be calling us or they wouldn't be calling, you know, the regional service. They would be using one of those 12 providers that are in the program. Okay. So on that, to that, in that component, it's very much like um, ride sharing or, yes, sir. or whatever with Uber, Lyft, or whatever, yes, but just with providers <coughs> that have the capability of providing ADA transit. That's correct. Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> okay. That answers my oh, first question. Thank he, you. He had, uh, he had made me think of a couple things that I, I think might might be pertinent. If uh, somebody got a ride share and say they went to Mesa, dropped off, do their business, when they make that call, is Mesa then charged for that return trip using that same provider rather than Glendale? Mayor, no, sir. It would be the, the resident city of, of Oregon. So, so it's resident where they live. Not That's correct. Okay. That's correct. So Glendale would be paying for both trips. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Go ahead. I just, so, so just so that because so we understand the paratransit. We're the regional policy, and it's a regional policy that was adopted. I don't know, ten, twelve, however long ago it was, is that the this paratransit we as a region decided to. They can go anywhere in the system, that's within a half mile of a bus stop in Mesa or any place that's in our grid and our system of, of bus system that that we're required to take the paratransit rider anywhere they want to go within a half mile of that of a bus an existing stop which is a lot of covers a lot of area so um how just so if you don't mind mayor i could ask kevin to walk us through now though what we're using now if somebody wants to go to the olive garden in mesa because that's their favorite um, we're required to take them um, and then what happens to the ride that took them out there so, Mayor, Councilmember Tomachow, that's correct. So, if first of all, it would have to be determined if it was an ADA service area in Mesa, the Olive Garden. If it is and the person is ADA certified, they would book that trip in advance. They would have to book that at least 24 hours in advance. And then the regional system, which is operated by um, MTM under contract for Valley Metro, would pick the person up in Glendale and take them out to Mesa. And then because it is an ADA trip, they would have to book the return trip also in advance. So they would book, if say they want to go tomorrow, they would book both the going and the return trip today. And then whenever they book the return trip, they would have to be done. And then they would come back into Glendale and we would pay for both those trips out and back. The client would pay $4 because it's a regional ADA trip. And then we would pay the, the remaining costs. I, I do have a question. And I don't know, I don't think that the other cities are doing this, but because we have, if we, if we did this as a pilot, um, I don't know whether you could say you can either you can use the existing system and book book both trips in advance for tomorrow. But if you want to do on demand, we can we can um, shrink the the system down a little bit. Are we are we allowed to do that under federal regulations? Are you talking we're saying we the, ride the ride choice? Ride choice as an option and say you can. We're going to give you the paratransit ride. You can go to the Olive Garden in Mesa if, if that's what you want to do. Um, but and you then you have to book in advance because it's how 25 miles let's say I don't know how far it is to the Olive Garden and Mesa but if you want to just 
go to an Olive Garden that's within 10 miles of, your, of our jurisdiction, you can use this on-demand service. You can use Ride Choice. Are we even allowed to, to, do, to run it like that? Mayor Councilman Tromachoff, I'm not sure how restrictive we can get with the Ride Choice program. I haven't had that in-depth of a discussion with Tom, um, but I can certainly ask. All I, from what I, the conversations we've had, he told me that the city determines eligibility. It's countywide. You can't go down to into Pinal or um, you know Tucson or up to Globe. It has to be within the county. But other than that, he didn't tell me of any other restrictions. I, I'll, I'll certainly talk to him and see if that's okay. something that we could look at. Because I was wondering about that. If we continue to to be offer the paratransit unlimited, basically paratransit within the within the region, um, but if this ride choice is an alter, an option to people who who want to take shorter trips, are willing to take shorter trips on demand, um, if we're able to restrict the the you know the the distance. Um, and and they're, thereby saving money because most people would probably rather do it on demand anyway. Um, so I just I was just curious if that was even allowed. I don't know what the federal regulations are. Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Clark. Thank you, Mayor. I find this all very confusing. If you want to know the truth, and I'm sure the people at home do as well. When you bring this back for further discussion, can you dumb it down for me? And for example. Give me some examples of someone who books a trip to the infamous Olive Garden in Mesa. What it would cost if, the, if it were through ride choice, and we only do internally, right? We don't even go yes, outside of Glendale. That's correct. But I, just tell me what it would cost the city and what it would cost that person. And, and do a couple of examples. Now, would you be using ride choice within the city? It, would that be part of the pilot program? Mayor, Councilman Clark, again, it's up to the city. I, I would say no. My recommendation would be no because we provide the service already. Okay, but that is a possibility. So it then is. give me a, a couple of examples. I live in Yucca District, and I want to go up to Choya District to a doctor. What would it cost to do that with ride choice, and what would that cost to do it with the city? Make it simpler so that people can understand in dollars and cents what the real difference is between the two programs. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Everybody good? You good? We're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, item five? Council item of special interest, partnership with Luke Air Force Base to build an indoor small arms range. Mayor, members of the council, here, here to provide staff report on this item is Rick St. John, Deputy City Manager. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council. We're here today to get your consensus to move a council item of special interest provided by Mayor Wires on a partnership, potential partnership with Luke Air Force Base through a Department of Defense program to build a joint use indoor small arms range at literally next to no cost to the city. Uh, so the scope of work for this project would be for InterGov to identify land locations, possible land locations, and then for budget and finance to look at funding opportunities and a reimbursement schedule that we could agree to uh, with Luke and the Department of Defense. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. You said little to no cost, but would we have to acquire a site and pay for that site? Mayor, Council Member um, Clark, if it is a city-owned site, then no, we wouldn't have to buy it, obviously, but uh, we would be using that space, which I'm sure there would be some associated costs with that. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm amenable to at least exploring it and getting more information. Thank you. Question? Uh, yes. Um, and I'm willing to learn more about this, so bring it back. But one of the things I want to learn about it is, is this compatible with our Gripstick uh, site? And if not, why not? Mayor, Council Member Turner, the Gripstick would be one of the locations that we studied. Uh, we are currently doing a master plan study of the space at the Gripstick. We have contemplated a small arm, indoor small arms range at that location. However, from my initial understandings, from the results of that master plan, 
It, it does not seem that that's going to be a viable location. I don't have the answers as to why and won't have those answers until the master plan, plan is complete. Thank you. I'm sorry. I said thank you. Oh, you bet. Any other questions, Claire? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Mr. So, Mr. St. John, who who would this be for? Who would who would be using this? Mayor, Council Member Tomalchaff, it would be a city-owned facility. Luke Air Force would have first rights to the facility for use, and then we would have rights to do with the property whatever we saw fit to do with the property when Luke was not using the space, which includes renting it out to outside entities for revenue. Okay, I, I'm going to elaborate on that because because you didn't cover all the parts. Uh, DOD would pay for the facility. Literally 100% pay for it, along with interest on it, uh, uh, approximately an eight to 10 year note, would get all of our money back, plus they pay operating. So uh, right now the current contract in Washington State that they have with the base up there, uh, they're getting almost a half a million dollars a year operating, and the facility will be completely 100% theirs on city property managed by city employees. Um, the advantage to the city is right now we don't have an indoor range. I found out that our officers are not spending a lot of time training in the summertime because it's just too hot. It's way too hot. Our officers? Our officers. Or, okay. Luke desperately needs an indoor range. They're looking for an opportunity. And we discovered this uh, through some of the people that I work with. I flew up to <clears throat> Washington State went out and toured the facility up there. Uh, that particular facility up there, the county uh, built a grip stick around the shooting range as a partnership. We don't want to do that. We don't need a grip stick. We have that already. We just need the shooting range, period. So our costs will be less. The facility will be smaller. But it gives us opportunities for our officers to train. And if other cities want to use it, we could literally rent out uh, that time when Luke's not scheduled and we don't schedule our officers, we could actually bring additional funds in. And it's not a bad thing to have partnerships with other cities. So I, I've never seen an opportunity where we have a better chance of getting a facility that will do more good for virtually almost nothing, almost nothing, and it's ours. So thank you, Mayor. That helps a lot. Um, so, the, so the city would be basically – depending on it sounds like grip six not an ideal location donating you know however much space you would need an acre i don't know of land with like some that's, sort of but that's not accurate because it's it's a city property it's a city building but they so they would get a ground lease or something to build on there but no no the city owns it so if we own the property and we build a building on it and dod pays for it it's still our building we don't need a lease dod to pays for the construction of the building we pay for the construction, and we immediately, as soon as it's completed, we get 10% plus interest. The following year, 10% plus interest on up until it's paid off. And it, it, right now, the and we can do that contract eight, 10 years, whatever we want to do. But the current situation right now with the facility up there, I believe, is 10 years. Is that not correct? Mayor, I believe it's seven years. Seven years. Okay, so it's even better. All right. And so do I have to go through you when I'm talking to you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so in Spokane, do, are they City of Spokane employees that, so how do, I just don't understand how it works, that's all. Okay, so, well, so, so it's not a city, it's the county facility. Okay. So it would be like Maricopa County Sheriff's Department. Okay. It's their county up there. They own that building. The DOD, the Air Force Base, basically through a contract uh, uh, that they went into is paying them to build the building right. over, you said, a seven-year time, along with the interest on the money for the seven years along with operating costs. The city actually hires people to manage it, operate it, keep it maintained, and run. And, and they reimburse? Right now they have about a half million dollars they're getting just for that. So so they reimburse, They get the city would be reimbursed for the operating costs. So we'd- It's, so it's all in contract before, okay. before it right. ever starts. So all right, well, it's, yeah. it, it's, it's really incredible, and it's one of the very few opportunities I've seen where uh, if, if every city knew about this, every city would be trying to do it. Fortunately for us, uh, Luke's in our city, and so uh, we were the first choice when they talked with us. So when you bring this back, Mr. St. John, you're going to bring back kind of a uh, s how we would scale it and then how the numbers are based on, on the Spokane model, how it would work? Mayor, Council Member Tom Chaff, that's correct. We would talk about terms of an IGA between us, Luke Air Force Base, and the DOD for reimbursement, the length of time, 
what makes best sense for us. Okay, thank you. I'm, yeah. I'm in favor of taking the next yeah. step. And, and just so everybody knows that uh, this took uh, about 10 years for them to put this entire project together. Uh, we're only looking at a small portion. We don't have to spend all the millions that they did on all the additional stuff. We have grip stick already. We don't need that. We just need a place where our officers can train, be proficient, and when they go out on calls, we know that they've got the best training possible and that muscle memory is there. Same thing with DOD uh, for, for the Air Force folks. Question? Mr. St. John, where do uh, police officers for Glendale currently um, train for with uh, small uh, caliber uh, firearms? Mayor Councilmember Aldama, almost exclusively at the uh, grip stick. So we already have a facility for small arms. Mayor Councilmember Aldama, it's an outdoor facility, yes. Okay, it's outdoor, not indoor. Correct. Okay, and we also have a long rifle range outdoor as well there. Mayor Councilmember Aldama, yes. Thank you. So they're training outdoors. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody have a consensus to move forward? Yeah, Thank very you. good. Thank you. Next item is item number six. Ms. Bauer. Downtown campus reinvestment project update. Mayor, members of the council, uh, this is update number 21 uh, for the DCRP. I just want to walk you through just some current pictures in case you haven't had a chance to see all the work uh, yourself. Um, as you came to the meeting here today. Uh, but as you can see, a lot of progress is being made. Uh, we're still in the demolition phase uh, of the project. And uh, you can see now the amphitheater has been essentially removed. Um, we've, um, we've got most of the floors now have been scraped and cleaned, and they're starting to do work as well inside the, um, uh, inside the um, uh, chambers area. Um, the one the last remaining thing, it shows the elevator shaft on the roof, and uh, but that's now down. That I think that came down yesterday. We had to decommission the elevators, and so now the um, the uh, roof is uh, of the building is pretty well been scraped and cleaned as well. You know, just a couple of things as we started peeling away uh, during the demolition. Uh, the council's uh, wisdom to go ahead and to move forward with the DCRP was really made even more evident as when we had a chance to pull a lot of the exterior panels off is that we saw where, for example, the moisture barrier that had been installed originally had failed and we were starting to see significant elements of failure, like for example, on the, uh, the pins that essentially the panels hung on were starting to fail. And so, I mean, I think we really, it, it wouldn't necessarily have happened next year, uh, but clearly there were major elements of the building envelope uh, that were going to be uh, really a challenge to maintain uh, in the coming years. Um, again, uh, the amphitheater, uh, again, a lot of work is being made there to get that uh, cleaned out and ready for the actual construction. Um, the, uh, here's a picture uh, just inside the council chambers, and you can see, again, a lot of the work inside the chambers is being scraped. And so, again, excellent progress uh, by Oakland Construction and their team and uh, they are still tracking uh, on schedule uh, for that. I've got just a real quick time lapse. Just thought you might enjoy uh, seeing the time lapse of the project. So I think it's, gonna, it's a fairly short amount of time. Um, Brent, is that something you can fire up? <coughs> You, know, you see the time lapse and you say, well, never cloudy in Arizona, but you can tell just by looking at the time lapse, we've had quite a bit of clouds and, and rain since the project started. You got to get uh, Flight of the Bumblebee music to the background for this. Again, just as a reminder, uh, citizens can go online and get updated 
on the status. We have a live cam, and they can also see the time lapse. Um, so all those citizens who are really interested in on the progress, uh, it is available 24-7 on our website. So the next, uh, the next phase where we're at currently, uh, our design team um, has been working hard to get the construction documents uh, finalized so that we can begin in issuing permits. And so right now we're currently reviewing a whole set of documents and plans, but they're continually be uh, submitted. And so the hope is that we'll be able to, uh, or the plan is that we'll be able to prepare and issue permits uh, starting in May. Um, the uh, work on the Velma Teague Library uh, study uh, starts in April and should be completed in June. And then we will bring back to the council for consideration the GMP3, which is the main contract for the, uh, the, the restoration of the building for the FF and E, uh, most of the major elements that'll be brought in mm -hmm. front of the uh, council in the, uh, we believe uh, the first or second meeting in June. And so with that, we'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Mayor, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thus far, you've got quite a bit done, so congratulations. Um, are there any unforeseens uh, to the infrastructure that would cause either uh, change orders or increase in, in what you thought the budget would be, anything with the uh, metal structure, anything at all that we couldn't see then that we can see now? Our design team, our team that's representing us as our owner reps, which includes Eddie Garcia, have been working very closely with both Oakland and our design team. Certainly there have been a number of things that we've discovered uh, during the deconstruction of the building. But at this point, uh, you know, even with all the uncertainty within the supply chain and the labor markets, we believe mm -hmm. we're still tracking very closely. We haven't seen any major issues that, that, that are gonna move the needle significantly regarding the, uh, the budget that the council wanted to stay within. But uh, in the next uh, two and a half months, we'll really be where the rubber meets the road on that and we'll have certainly a lot more assurance on that. But at this point, you're asking the same questions that I typically ask of our project team is how are we tracking towards budget and is there anything that's been a little bit uh, uh, unusual? Now, we uh, a couple weeks ago, we had to switch over from our fiber optics. We had to decommission all the fiber optics that ran into the building. The vendor that did that over the weekend ran into a number of issues, and that project took a little bit longer to get done. But again, compared to the complexity of doing that, uh, it still got resolved. And, and we still think we're tracking with, with the GMP2, which is the deconstruction we're still tracking within the budget thank you and the next question is um i understand through an email that um uh the oakland staff located a time capsule and we have some photos of that do we know yet what the city's planning on doing with that is it a re saving it for a rededication do you have any idea mayor councilmember aldama staff's been working on that we're going to really rely on the council to dictate what you would like to see on that and so uh, we have people internally that are going to walk through a series of options we'll bring that back to the council and then you can say you know we want to postpone opening it up we we want to just maybe open it up and, and start working on a new time capsule uh, we really think this is a decision of the city council so right now the time capsule itself is, is in a protected area. It's not been opened, and there's instructions not to open it up until we get direction from the council, uh, but that should be forthcoming. Excellent. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Mayor. Thank you. Um, perhaps I forgot, but uh, I was under the impression we weren't going to be doing all that much work inside the council chambers building. Um, uh, it kind of looks like maybe we are. Can you remind me of what the scope of work is in there? Um, Mayor, uh, Councilmember Turner, if you recall, the at the lower level of the council chambers, uh, which is where the B3 rooms are at, all of that's being reopened back up uh, to help be supportive of the amphitheater. So, okay. you know, green room, restrooms, storage areas. Uh, in terms of the upstairs, 
uh, area. Again, lobbies are cleared out, but you're, we're not doing a, as much on the uh, upper council chambers. But as you're all aware, we have a tour coming up uh, on Friday to look at some other examples of council chambers in the area. And then once we get that feedback, it'll help determine you know, exactly what extent. But our budget was somewhat constrained on how much we spent in the council chambers. And so we, you know, we'll keep the council fully informed about that constraint as we make recommendations going forward. So the photograph in here and the others uh, relating to that are at the amphitheater level? Yes, sir. Not, not up. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. With that said, before I go on to the uh, next item, uh, Phoenix Business Journal just announced its 15th uh, annual Most Admired Leader Awards, which recognizes accomplished executives and leaders in Arizona for their contributions to their organizations and communities. Uh, now, they did select 23 honorees for 2024. Uh, the list of names is impressive, and it re represents the best of Arizona's leaders. Of that 23, there's only one leader selected from government entity, uh, and I'm very proud to announce that our city manager, Kevin Phelps, is that government leader. Um, we've been saying for a long time, you're doing, <clears throat> doing a great job. It's really amazing to me is when other people recognize that outside of our city. So uh, congratulations, Kevin. It is my understanding that a special edition of the Business Journal uh, will come out in May, and they'll do a profile uh, on Mr. Phelps. Uh, Please, everybody join me in congratulating Kevin for this prestigious award. Mayor, point of personal privilege. Please. I, you know, these are tough, or for me, this is a tough award because it's really not an individual award. It gets portrayed as an individual award, but I'm of the firm belief that a, an award like this is about the organization. In other words, it's hard to recognize a leader if the person presenting or recognizing the leader doesn't respect the organization. And so I think this starts, you know, this is very much a report card on the work that has started at the council level and with our executive leadership team, but really it's reflective of our almost 2,000 employees and the work they've done. It would be impossibly recognized if the people in the outside looking in didn't hold this city up in the highest of, of you know, of esteem. And so while I'm certainly, uh, you know, humbled by the, uh, the recognition, uh, not for one second do I believe it was a, it's about myself and about what I've done. Uh, I've been blessed with a really uh, a fantastic council uh, my eight years here, uh, blessed to have an incredible leadership team, and then our 2,000 employees are just rock stars. So thank you for the recognition, but I, I hope all of you take a little bit of, uh, of, of pride that we struggled eight years ago to be really recognized and to be legitimized by a lot in the media and outside in this region, and that's no longer the case. I believe that, the, uh, that those in the outside have very much recognized what this city is accomplishing and continues to accomplish. And so thank you for the comments. And uh, But I'm really, uh, you know, my thanks really go out to our employees and to the council for making this all possible. But, but that's why you got the award because the leader recognizes that. So again, congratulations to you. Uh, with that, okay, now you got to go back to work. City manager report. Thank you. Um, I've got uh, three quick items. First, um, this coming Sunday, late in the day on Sunday, we will know uh, which four teams and their fan bases are gonna be traveling to Glendale, Arizona for the final four. Um, so just in 10 days, the first major events start taking place as part of this, uh, this celebration. Uh, it starts with on Friday, April 5th, uh, the stadium is gonna be open to the entire public as part of the Reese's Final Four Friday. And this is where the public can come in and they can see the stadium and see how it's configured for the Final Four. Uh, they'll get a chance to watch all the teams practice. Uh, and they'll also get a chance to see the All-Star Game, which is going to be featuring uh, student, senior student athletes from around the country that will be in that game. Uh, on April 6th, then, all eyes will clearly turn to the city of Glendale as the first of the two games will start off in the afternoon and then finish in the evening. Um, and then on, well, of course, that'll be followed by the championship game on Monday evening. Uh, now, for those who don't have tickets to the game on either Saturday or on Monday, ESPN will be set up in Westgate. That's gonna be their broadcast studio, which will be done outdoors. 
And so the fans can also uh, go to, to Westgate, get a chance to enjoy all that it has to offer, but also see the live broadcast uh, from kind of the pregame and postgame kinds of shows. Uh, second uh, is the Transportation Department in the City of Glendale has received an award from the National Safety Council called the Partner in Safety. And it's an award for our driver education program. As the council knows, you, you supported funding a program to outreach to our high school students because of the concern we have with the amount of accidents and fatalities that this region has seen and many off cases it's with the young people that are there. So ha having seen this challenge, our staff came up with an incredibly innovative program called Alive at 25. And we go through to all the different high schools and we train uh, the uh, and, and have discussions with the young drivers to really to bring home the seriousness of driving safely. And uh, so far we have graduated almost 1,400 students as part of this program. Um, so again, it was recognized nationally uh, for an outstanding program. It started with the council supporting the program. I know on behalf of the Transportation Department, we're very, uh, you know, we're very excited to receive this award. And then finally, Mayor, as per our policy uh, regarding the disposition of city-owned property, uh, I want to notify the council I have received an unsolicited offer for property owned by the city, and we'll be discussing that in executive session. And that concludes my report. Thank you. City Attorney's report. Nothing to report today. Thank you. Okay, next on, on the item uh, on the agenda uh, is council items of special interest. Council members have the opportunity to indicate topics they'd like to have discussed by this council at a future workshop. Mr. Aldama. None at this time. Council Member Clark. Nothing, Mayor. Council Member Miller. Uh, nothing today, Mayor. Ms. Tomachoff. Nothing today, Mayor. Mr. Turner. Nothing today, Mayor. Vice Mayor. Nothing, Mayor. And I have nothing. Can I get a motion to go into executive session? So move. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all, all in favor vote aye. 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 Any aye. opposed vote nay. Your guys have it, do have it. That motion carries. Uh, we were recessed for executive session. Leave your